So good evening and welcome to our first Learn and Share conference call of 2018. I am Russ Derry, Director of Education for Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, and I'll be moderating this discussion. The topic for tonight is epilepsy surgery, resection, disconnection, and ablation. And we're pleased to have as our speakers Dr. Ellen Eyre, who's a neurosurgeon at, with Henry Ford Comprehensive Epilepsy Program, and Dr. Christopher Paris, an epileptologist who's also with Henry Ford's Comprehensive Epilepsy Program. Could each of you briefly introduce yourself, uh, talk a little bit about your clinical and research interests, and describe your experience with this topic? Uh, after you, Ellen. Oh, okay. So I, as I said, my name is Ellen Ayer. I'm a neurosurgeon who also has a particular specialty in all areas of epilepsy surgery. Um, I also study how it is that we work to bring patients to epilepsy surgery um, and also am part of clinical trials that look at ways in which we can improve epilepsy surgery offering for our patients. Great. Okay. And Dr. Paris? Hi. Um, this is Chris Paris. Um, thanks, Russ. Uh, and uh, as mentioned, I'm a staff neurologist and epilepsy uh, specialist at Henry Ford Hospital. And uh, I work in the outpatient as well as inpatient settings, including the Henry Ford Epilepsy Monitoring Unit, where we admit uh, over 350 patients per year. Um, I primarily see patients with epilepsy and other seizure-related disorders. Um, and as an epilepsy specialist, I help guide the medical and potential surgical management for patients with uh, drug-resistant epilepsy. Um, some of my special areas of interest and in research include refractory and non-convulsive status epilepticus, responsive neurostimulation, critical care EEG monitoring, and quantitative EEG. Okay, great. Well, welcome both of you. I'm glad you could join us for this call. And uh, it's an interesting topic, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of good questions at the end, too. So um, on this call, we'll be reviewing the different surgical options for epilepsy that involve either the removal, disconnection, or destruction of brain tissue. And this includes temporal and extratemporal resection, um, multiple subpile tran transection, um, corpus callosotomy, functional hemispherectomy, stereotactic laser ablation, gamma knife surgery, and focused ultrasound. Um, we may touch on a few others if, if there are others, but uh, that's a lot to cover. So we won't be discussing neuromodulation surgeries tonight. We actually have a separate call on that topic scheduled on September 5th. Um, so let's start by talking about pre-surgical evaluation. Dr. Paris, at what point should a patient be evaluated for epilepsy surgery? So basically when, when seizures are not controlled with medications alone, that's, uh, that's when you know, surgery should at least be considered or undergoing evaluation uh, to see if that's an option. Um, and so we refer to um, this type of epilepsy as drug-resistant epilepsy, meaning specifically when someone has failed two or more anti-seizure medication trials um, at standard therapeutic doses um, and with appropriately chosen drugs for um, a particular patient's type of epilepsy. So that's overall about 20 to 30 percent of patients with uh, epilepsy, which amounts to around 750,000 patients uh, in the United States. And we know that after two failed medication trials, the likelihood of seizure freedom with subsequent drug trials is quite low, um, about 15 to 20 percent at best. Um, and this is important for many reasons. Um, Drug-resistant epilepsy is uh, associated with higher rates of premature death, seizure-related injuries, psychosocial problems, and long-term uh, cognitive deficits. It's not always um, readily um, explainable as to why uh, medications don't work in a particular patient, but this can relate to things like the underlying cause of the epilepsy, um, the location uh, of where the seizures are uh, originating, um, and other factors that are associated with a higher rate of drug resistance are the number of previous medications someone has tried, um, early onset of epilepsy, a high rate of generalized tonic-clonic seizures, uh, any history of status epilepticus, um, remote brain injury, or developmental delay. And the American Academy of Neurology recommends 
um, that patients with drug-resistant epilepsy be referred to uh, an epilepsy surgery center like uh, Henry Ford. Great. And, and there's a significant delay um, between when someone is identified as drug-resistant uh, or falls into that category and when they're evaluated for surgery, right? There's, um, it's years. As that is often the case, yeah. yeah. Yeah, many patients will go years and, you know, undergo multiple medication trials, um, sometimes, you know, t 10 or more medication uh, trials before you know, they are referred to a, a comprehensive epilepsy center. Right, right. Okay, well, um, so can you briefly describe the most common diagnostic tests that are used in pre-surgical evaluation and how these te tests help you and the patient determine what surgical approach would be best? Absolutely. Um, we use several um, radiologic and also neurophysiologic tests to evaluate patients who have drug-resistant epilepsy in order to determine where in the brain their seizures originate. Um, which could be from one particular location, more than one specific location, or involving the whole brain. Um, and the tests we do also help determine whether the seizure onset zone is a, an area that can be surgically removed or resected without resulting in significant or disabling uh, neurologic um, or cognitive dysfunction. So um, MRI uh, is one of the most commonly used uh, tests to evaluate someone with drug-resistant epilepsy. Um, this provides a detailed anatomical picture of the brain, um, which can be used to identify lesions um, that may be associated with the underlying cause of epilepsy. And this is uh, very important because the presence of a lesion that's uh, identifiable on MRI uh, is associated with a significantly greater likelihood of seizure freedom after undergoing epilepsy surgery. Um, EEG uh, or electroencephalography is another one of the fundamental tools for epilepsy diagnosis in general and also for drug resistant epilepsy. Um, and this is typically done as part of a pre surgical evaluation in an epilepsy monitoring unit um, where patients are monitored for several consecutive days on EEG. And the goal is to record a patient's uh, typical seizures on EEG to characterize both the clinical semiology of their seizures and the corresponding brainwave uh, changes to help localize where in the brain the seizures are coming from. And we also look for interictal abnormalities uh, in between seizures on the EEG during this time. Um, some other tests that uh, are commonly used are um, neuropsychology evaluation, um, and this is a baseline assessment of intellectual functioning um, and uh, testing for verbal or nonverbal learning and memory deficits and can help to uh, lateralize or localize functional domains in their relationship to the seizure onset zone um, and helps uh, us to counsel patients about um, what to expect in terms of memory outcome uh, following a, a resective surgery, for instance, in temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, another test that's um, a bit older but still used today is a, a WADA test. Um, this is a somewhat invasive test where um, uh, anesthetic medication is injected into each carotid artery, um, and that suppresses the function of the injected hemisphere and allows for um, learning and memory testing to be performed on each hemisphere independently. Um, and that helps determine language hemisphere dominance and assess the risk of postoperative memory decline. Um, a newer modality called functional MRI um, has uh, also been used um, for similar reasons to lateralize and localize language processes, um, as well as sensory and motor uh, cortex. And sorry, not another, another but oh, is, is yeah, functional sure. MRI grad pretty much replacing WADA for the most part for for um, um, or, or there's a shift towards, F, yeah, there is definitely a shift towards F fMRI, um, you know, in, in centers that utilize it. Um, there are some instances when um, maybe the if fMRI data is inconclusive that uh, a lot of, you know, still may be necessary. Okay, great. 
Um, and then a, a couple more tests briefly that, that we uh, use frequently in drug-resistant epilepsy for evaluation are a PET scan or FDG PET. This is a functional test that measures brain glucose metabolism and can help localize uh, seizure onset zone. Um, and finally, an ictal spect um, is an imaging test that's actually performed while a patient's having a seizure, and it detects increases in cerebral blood, excuse me, blood flow that can aid in the localization of the seizures. Um, and this test is, is only done in um, certain centers. It requires a considerable amount of coordination and technical uh, factors, so it's, it's um, you know, only done in uh, select some specialty centers. And is that uh, also true for MEG? Is that something that's only used sparingly in pre-surgical evaluation and only only at certain centers? Yes. Okay. Magnetoencephalography is another um, modality that's not maybe as common, but um, a lot going on there with uh, research in terms of helping to localize seizure onsets. Great. Great. All right. Um, now let's discuss the most common type of epilepsy surgery, uh, temporal lobe resection. Dr. Eric, can you briefly describe the range of procedures that fall under this category and then how you decide how much brain tissue to remove? Sure. So the temporal lobe is a part of the brain that is very often the cause of seizures. It's the area that's just sort of, if you think of where your ear is, kind of just in front of it and then towards the center of your head is where the temporal lobe is. And so the part of the temporal lobe that seems to have the most um, important part in causing seizures for most people is very deep in the brain. It's actually, you have to go a couple centimeters um, underneath the skin and the bone to get to that area. And it's called the hippocampus, which is responsible for taking in new memories. And next to it is a structure called the amygdala. So often what we're trying to do is we want to make sure that we're taking out both what's called the amygdala and the hippocampus. But there are a lot of um, instances where the surface tissue is also involved in the cause of the seizures and, and or some of the tissue around it. So when we think about what areas of the brain or what part of the temporal lobe we need to remove, we are looking at it from the perspective of, is it only the amygdala and hippocampus, or is it that area plus tissue that's next to it? We do know that patients who have what's called a anterior temporal lobectomy, which removes the surface tissue as well as those deeper structures, tend to do a little bit better in terms of seizure freedom than those who only have the selective, what's called a selective amygdala hippocampectomy. So in our center, we have leaned towards doing an anterior temporal lobectomy, although there are some situations in which it's better to just try and do that selective part. Um, so in that case, we kind of are going through that surface tissue to remove the deep structure. Then when it comes to doing a temporal lobectomy, we determine how much of that surface tissue to remove, largely based on whether someone's right side or left side of the brain is causing seizures and which side is responsible for their speech. So that's where a lot of the tests that Dr. Paris was just talking about come into play in us making the decision of how much tissue to remove. Okay. And... Um... I guess, are, are there situations um, with temporal lobe epilepsy where you do just a lesionectomy, where you're just removing an identified lesion in the temporal lobe, or is it pretty much exclusively uh, the um, you're removing a much larger portion? So certainly there are situations where someone may have, for instance, an abnormal cluster of blood vessels called a cavernoma or a low-grade tumor that's in that location. And then we're tailoring the surgery to, is it just that abnormality that needs to be removed, that lesion? Um, or, as is often the case, some of the tissue right around that lesion 
will take up responsibility or become part of the tissue that causes the seizures. Mm -hmm. So even in someone where we think we can identify that it's not the deep structures of the medulla hippocampus, but it's something else in the temporal lobe that needs to be removed, we're taking into consideration how much, if any, of the tissue right around that lesion also needs to come out in order to fully treat the seizures. Right, right. Okay. Uh, Dr. Paris, can you describe the, the influence that various patient factors have on the outcome of temporal lobe surgery? Sure. One of the most important is um, the presence of a, of a lesion, so something that we can identify on an imaging test, um, most specifically an MRI, um, is associated with a much uh, greater likelihood of achieving seizure freedom after epilepsy surgery. Um, a positive PET scan is also uh, associated with better outcome even when an MRI may uh, be normal. Um, uh, some other factors that are associated with better outcomes would be concordant ictal and interictal EEG data. So if the seizures that are captured when someone's in the epilepsy monitoring unit look to all come from the, the right location, the same location, and then the interictal abnormalities in between seizures are also in that location, um, we consider that data to be concordant and that's uh, associated with a better outcome. Um, and in um, temporal lobe epilepsy, the duration of epilepsy can have some effect um, as temporal lobe epilepsy or TLE is considered by many to be a progressive condition um, in terms of the cognitive decline, uh, memory impairment. So um, there is some mixed data on this, but in general, earlier surgery is, is favored. Um, and in terms of memory, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, in terms of memory loss after epilepsy surgery, um, this can be seen in uh, about a quarter to, to a third of patients um, in left-sided resections, it's more often to involve impairments in verbal memory where um, right-sided resections are more often associated with spatial um, memory and learning deficits. Okay. And in terms of right versus left, is there typically a, a, any difference in terms of likelihood of seizure freedom, or is it more re is that distinction more important in terms of function? Um, more in terms of function. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. The typically the seizure freedom is is really associated with what you know. Have we identified a lesion? Right. It can range in temporal lobe epilepsy anywhere from sixty to eighty percent in someone where we've seen on either the MRI, the PET scan, that there's an identifiable abnormality. Patients are much more likely to be seizure-free, but we certainly know that there are patients out there where we've been able to figure out that it's coming from the temporal lobe. They just don't have something that shows up on a picture. A little bit less often are they seizure-free, but still we see a lot of good outcomes. Okay. Um, and overall, roughly what percentage of people who have temporal lobe resection become free of seizures that affect awareness? So I would say six again, sixty to eighty percent, depending mm -hmm. somewhat on those um, whether or not we know there's a lesion, and also that we've done our our job up front in making sure that we've characterized the seizures as truly coming from that that region. Okay. Um, Dr. Ayer, what are the most common surgical complications and functional deficits associated with temporal lobe resection, and roughly how often do they occur? Sure. So I like to think of these in two parts, one being for someone who's undergoing such a surgery, what should they expect? Certainly, any time we open up the, the brain and the head, Things like headaches we expect for a period of time after surgery, getting tired more frequently, um, just having a lower tolerance, being more emotional potentially. Going through the temporal lobe, what a lot of people don't realize is that they have a muscle over the bone in that area and so that connects to their jaw. And so a lot of times people will experience um, jaw tightness for a while after surgery as well. 
So those are things I tell people to really expect. The other things that can happen um, are related to them, their personal characteristics. So Dr. Paris has talked about memory loss. We're looking in a variety of pre-surgical evaluation to understand how much of that part of the brain is still helping out with memory. For most people, it's not doing much and is continuing to get worse before the point that we're recommending we remove that tissue. But still, it may be doing a little bit, and so someone may notice some change in word finding, for instance, or in remembering something that they're looking at, depending on if it's right or left side of the brain. And then the other thing is that there are pathways that go between the eye and towards the back of the brain that loop around in the, near these structures. And to really get all of the seizure-causing tissue out, we typically cause there to be a little tiny wedge. If you think of your vision, your field of vision as a pie, a tiny little cutter, a little wedge, you just don't happen to see things in that area anymore. So for most people, they don't recognize, they don't know it. It doesn't keep them from doing anything that they want to get back to doing. So that's what I like to make sure I've shared with people before going, undergoing surgery that that's what to expect. Certainly there are the big, bad, ugly things that we worry about, but are very uncommon, so less than 1%. Things like having a significant amount of bleeding, um, or stroke, uh, things that cause weakness, paralysis, sensation loss, loss of speech. Um, those things can happen, but they're very rare. Okay. And what, what quadrant of vision is most often affected um, when you mention that, the vision loss? Sure. So if someone is taking, uh, if we need to take out, for instance, the right temporal lobe, then I would tell them that that little tiny wedge is no longer going to be there in the upper left corner, so in the upper part, but on the opposite side of their vision. Okay. And that's typically, like you said, not something people even notice until you point it out? Correct, correct. And it certainly has been, you know, a conversation people worry about, well, if I become seizure-free, can I get back to driving? Um had one individual who was really concerned about being able to see things when they're playing basketball. Um, and again, most people find that they can get back to doing what they'd like to. Great, great. Um, so extra temporal resection takes place outside of the temporal lobes, um, maybe in the frontal, parietal, or occipital lobe, and typically has lower success rates than temporal lobe resection. Dr. Eric, can you talk about some of the challenges of performing resective surgery outside of the temporal lobes? Sure. So outside of the temporal lobe, we find a lot more variability in terms of exactly where the seizures come from. So you can say they come from the frontal lobe, but the frontal lobe is large and some parts of the frontal lobe are involved in speech, some parts are involved in movement. Um, if you talk about the occipital lobe, we're looking at areas of vision. And so it's the two big challenges there are one, really narrowing down the part of the brain that is causing the seizures, and particularly if there's not a clear abnormality on imaging. But then the other challenge is knowing or sorting out whether that area that's causing the seizures also happens to be living in a part of the brain that the person is using to perform some tasks. So are the seizures coming from a part of the brain that also is responsible for getting words out or for moving an arm or for seeing things in a particular area? So we want to know um, whether that's the case so that we can avoid a resective surgery in areas like that. Okay. Um, Dr. Paris, what has research shown, shown us in terms of seizure-free rates um, after different types of extratemporal surgery? So like Dr. Aaron mentioned, this is a much more um, heterogeneous population when we're talking about extratemporal um, uh, epilepsy. 
And so the um, seizure freedom rates are uh, also variable. Uh, overall, a bit lower, but there's a, a large range of you know, around 10 or 15 up to 65 percent, roughly. Um, and you know, the it can depend on the location of um, where the seizures are coming from. Uh, the frontal lobe is the second most common site uh, after the temporal lobe for epilepsy surgery, um, whereas the parietal and occipital lobes are um, significantly less common. Um, in any case, the presence of, a, of an identifiable lesion still strongly influences uh, the outcome. Um, other factors, um, such as the proximity to uh, eloquent cortex or um, parts of the brain that are essential for uh, sensory processing, like things like language and motor function, visual function. Um, if the area where the seizures are coming from is near or involving eloquent cortex, then that can limit how much uh, resection uh, or brain can be removed and then that may in turn contribute to a lower rate of seizure freedom. Um, and yeah. Okay. Um, so we've talked about removing brain tissue. Another approach that is used less often is to disconnect certain neuronal pathways. Um, such procedures include uh, multiple subpaleal transection, corpus callosotomy, and functional hemispherectomy. Dr. Paris, can you talk about each of these procedures, um, the circumstances under which they might be considered, and what patients can expect in terms of outcomes? Mm -hmm. So multiple subpaleal transections um, involve um, severing uh, intracortical fibers at uh, small intervals, um, which uh, reduces um, discharges from the epileptic uh, zone and limits the spread without jeopardizing the function of that uh, cortex. Um, and this can be an option when uh, the epileptic focus is um, near or involving eloquent cortex, as I was just discussing. Um, and for example, um, in Landau-Kleffner syndrome is one uh, specific type of epilepsy where um, this type of procedure uh, has been performed with, with good success. Um, overall, the outcomes are variable, but the um, short-term uh, outcomes are, are usually quite good. Um, corpus callosotomy is, is another type of pr uh, procedure. This is a disconnection procedure um, where uh, seizure propagation between the two uh, sides of the brain is um, uh, stopped by um, severing the uh, corpus callosum. And this is usually reserved for um, children who have significant cognitive impairments, such as those with uh, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome or other um, epileptic encephalopathies or symptomatic uh, epilepsies. But it can be very useful to prevent uh, seizures that have a, a big impact on um, safety and quality of life, like atonic seizures or drop attacks. Um, and uh, an anterior or partial callosotomy results in 70 to 80 percent reduction in seizure frequency and then may even higher up to 80 to 90 percent for a complete callosotomy. Um, and functional hemispherectomy or, um, or just a hemispherectomy is a more uh, serious procedure that's reserved for those with devastating epilepsy um, where their entire half of the brain is involved. Um, and that can include congenital syndromes like hemimegalencephaly, cortical dysplasia, resveus and encephalitis. Um, and this is usually in the setting of uh, significant pre-existing neurologic impairments like uh, hemiplegia or uh, paralysis on one side, uh, visual field defects, or language impairment. Um, and this is also more commonly done in children than um, in adults. Um, but there is a you know, 60 to 85 percent um, rate of uh, seizure freedom as a result of, of a hemispherectomy. Okay. And in terms of the uh, corpus callosotomy, is the, the 70 to 80 percent seizure reduction, is that overall or is that just in the atonic seizures? Um, that's it. That's in just in general okay. seizure types. So it, it can also reduce the frequency of generalized tonic clonic seizures and, and other seizure types, but the, the drop attacks or um, atonic seizures, you know, are um, you know can cause significant injury and um, so that's you know one that 
one one modality that is helpful at reducing those. Yeah. Okay. And and sometimes people will just find that their that reduction in seizures is that their seizures will become smaller than they were before because they aren't able to spread as far. So not even just the drop attack, sometimes just that disconnection means that any seizures that are still ongoing just aren't as big. Exactly, yes. Right. And Dr. Ayer, what are the biggest challenges and risks in perf performing each of these procedures? Sure. So the multiple subpeal transection we have generally reserved for cases where the seizure onset, where in the brain the seizures are coming from, is also a part of the brain that is responsible, for example, for speech or for movement. And so in those instances, the big risk is that there is um, a loss of that function that we're trying to, to keep, to preserve. Um, because of the limitations of that surgery and the fact that it is really just to reduce seizures, we have been moving away from that in a lot of ways um, because there are a lot of new um, opportunities, new treatment approaches um, for those situations that we didn't have before. For the corpus callosotomy, which again, as Dr. Paris said, is crosses both kids and adults, um, a lot of the same concerns about things like bleeding, stroke, infection are true there as, as they were with, say, temporal lobectomy. Sometimes uh, patients will have um, what's called a, um, a mutism, or they'll have difficulty speaking after uh, disconnection surgery like a corpus callosotomy or have trouble trying to recognize information from one side of the body to the other. And that can take some time um, to recover, but it often does over the course of, of several days to weeks, occasionally to months. Um, so sometimes people do feel after a corpus callosotomy that they've taken a step back in all the things that they would be doing normally, but it gets better. Um, for a functional hemispherectomy in those situations, often people are so severely affected by the structural abnormality that is the reason for their seizures in their brain um, and from the seizures themselves that we don't tend to see significant worsening um, or changes. We're, and we're often not offering that surgery in someone who we know is going to lose a whole lot of function because they have good function. So we're really trying to tailor surgeries these days to what will give us the most effective seizure control with limiting any loss of function that someone might have. Great. Um, so the third category of surgery we'll be dis discussing includes those surgeries that work by destroying seizure-causing brain tissue rather than removing or disconnecting it. This includes stereotactic laser ablation, focused ultrasound, and gamma knife surgery. Um, so laser ablation is currently probably the most widely used of these approaches for patients with ep epilepsy. Dr. Ayer, can you describe the, this technology and, uh, and the techniques involved in this type of surgery? And also sure, the advantages exactly. and disadvantages when compared to, with resective surgery? Absolutely. So laser ablation um, is an FDA-approved treatment for uh, lesioning, for ablating, for, I guess, a uh, uh, way of thinking about it, burning a lesion within the brain using a laser light that is inserted through a fine catheter into the brain. There is an ongoing study in terms of how we use that towards epilepsy surgery we'll talk about in a minute. But basically what laser ablation allows us to do, if we take temporal lobe epilepsy or um, mesial temporal lobe ex epilepsy, temporal sclerosis as an example, it allows us to, with very um, high accuracy, place a labor laser fiber into that amygdala and hippocampus and then turn on the laser and it effectively burns the tissue specifically within the brain without 
basically hitting any of the areas right next to it. So we're able to really focus the treatment to just the lesion. So there are other circumstances in which this also might be helpful. So there's something called a hypothalamic hamartoma. So uh, an actual a structural lesion in the hypothalamus um, that's a discrete lesion. It's also been used in those situations because we can, rather than having to uh, make openings in the brain and the skull that are larger and that make that force us to, you know, travel open a lot of brain tissue to get to it, this is just a very small fiber that passes through that tissue to get to the lesion and allows us to eliminate that lesion um, with the laser fiber. So patients have done very well with this. Um, it's typically overnight surgery um, and, again, a very small opening in the brain. We're still in the process of really trying to understand the advantages and disadvantages relative to some of the traditional surgeries, um, but the data that we do have indicates that an advantage is that people, other than getting out of the hospital faster, having less pain that and recovering faster, that we may not see so many side effects, things like thinking problems and you know, slowness and other things that people can experience after surgery that may actually do better with um, the smaller laser procedure. Now, there are two other kinds of strategies that have been used to or are being looked at to be used in, it really is specifically in temporal lobe surgery. One is gamma knife, and we've had a good study that has looked at this where Radiation is focused, so stereotactic radiation is focused on the structures in the temporal lobe in order to, again, make it so that tissue can't function anymore and therefore can't cause any seizures. The outcomes have been good. About 60, 65% of patients were seizure-free. However, the radiation takes time to take effect, and so it's been hard to get enough patients for us to, you know, have a really, you know, wonderful high volume to, you know, share with people um, what the long-term outcome is going to be just because it, it can take from nine months to two years for someone to go from having that gamma knife surgery to becoming seizure-free. And there's frequently a period of time in that, from in between those two periods where there's actually an increase in seizures, which signals to us that the brain is, that part of the brain is dying off, um, but it can be very frustrating. Then the last one is focused ultrasound. That is um, probably going to be less helpful for epilepsy. It's a nice um, tool in the sense that it's totally non-invasive, like the gamma knife surgery is. You do have to shave the head in order for the ultrasound to work correctly. However, the ultrasound is only really effective in certain parts of the brain um, because it can't bounce off the bone or, you know, be too close to the surface of the brain, those kinds of things. So there are really only very few uh, lesions or causes of epilepsy that a focus ultrasound would be a possibility for. Okay. And, and like you said, that it's largely because of the restrict or the limitations of how close to bone it can be, and and that sort of thing. Yes, it really is only um, the the technology itself mm -hmm. is limited um, by by a bunch of things, right? How getting the ultrasound to all focus into one area means that that area has to be a certain distance from other things okay. so that the ultrasound won't bounce off of it. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And are there are there specific indications that um it might might prove promising for or, um I, I know one is the hypothalamic. Yeah, the yeah. hypothalamic hemorrhage, yeah. which we mentioned briefly earlier. Right. Yes. Okay. Great. Um and um, Dr. Paris, can you give a few examples of uh, epilepsy-related factors that might make um, 
these um, ab ablation type surgeries a particularly good option for a patient? Mm -hmm, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, the a big advantage is they're uh, you know the less invasive nature of these uh, techniques, um, and so for patients who may be considered high risk surgical candidates, that that's one aspect you know that they. Um, may be considered uh, better. And then also the ability to target sites that are deep within the brain um, in a non-invasive way or uh, close to eloquent cortex, that's an advantage of um, either laser ablation or gamma knife surgery. Um, and if someone has um, multifocal lesions or um, multiple uh, regions within the brain that are thought to be causing seizures, such as um, from focal cortical focal cortical dysplasia um, or tuberous sclerosis. Um, this, you know, offers the ability to treat more than one um, lesion um, potentially uh, at the same time or sequentially uh, over time. And um, it's important to note that this isn't, it's not mutually ex exclusive from undergoing resective epilepsy surgery. So you can have um, one of these other procedures done like a laser ablation and if you know complete seizure freedom isn't achieved, then it's still possible to uh, later undergo uh, resective epilepsy surgery. Um, but the big you know consideration is uh, trying to get some more long-term uh, data on the outcome to really know how effective these procedures are um, for patients with ep epilepsy over time. Right, and that, and that kind of leads into another question um, that I, where it, it's, like you said, it, we probably don't have enough data to know this yet, but in the future, do you foresee laser ablation or, or similar surgeries eventually becoming as common as resective surgeries or surpassing it or even replacing it entirely? I wouldn't say replacing it, um, but I think it's going to, it will definitely continue to grow. And I'll be curious to hear Dr. Ayer's thoughts. But, you know, our, our ability to identify different types of epilepsy and causes of epilepsy um, with more advanced imaging um, has grown significantly um, in recent years. And, and so we're kind of fine tuning um, uh, the ability to target types of lesions that we didn't used to be able to. Um, offer interventional treatment for, and um, I think that that's only going to continue to grow. Yeah, I would agree. I, I don't think there's going to be a time where we're not doing any resective surgery because there are um, a variety of, of reasons in everybody's individual. We really need to tailor the surgery to the individual, but I do envision some of these procedures becoming maybe as common um, as a resective surgery. Um, and a lot of this is going to be based on information that we're still gathering. So as I mentioned before, laser ablation is an FDA-approved technology for ablating a, quote, lesion of the brain. And if somebody has, say, mesial temporal lobe sclerosis, that's a lesion of the brain, we can do that. We as a community, Dr. Paris and I and Henry Ford included, are really committed to understanding that better, and in particularly in the setting of hippocampal sclerosis or mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, what really are the true outcomes, benefits, and risks of performing the surgery by doing a laser ablation rather than uh, hip doing an open resection? And so. There's an ongoing trial. It's a multi-center trial um, throughout the United States. Henry Ford is one of those institutions where if, um, you know, if someone is an appropriate candidate for, the, for laser ablation, um, we are doing the procedure the way that we would do it in any other situation, but asking individuals um, for their willingness to help us and understanding it better by keeping some seizure diaries ahead of time and afterwards, and um, and and basically allowing us to determine, you know, are we getting the same seizure freedom rates that we are expecting? Are there side effects that we had not expected? Are the in, the ways in which we think this is better in reducing, say, cognitive or thinking problems after surgery? 
are you know are we really can we document can we prove that that we're really doing better for patients by doing the surgery this way rather than um the other uh, approach open approach so um it is an ongoing going trial um but it's also a situation where that procedure is still available even for individuals, at least at our institutions, available um, even if they aren't able to undergo or can't participate in the trial. Okay, great. And that's called the SLATE trial. And, um, Correct. And we it's do the it. selective laser ablation, yep, and temporal epilepsy trial. Yeah, and we do have information on that on our website under the um, participate in research uh, portion, page of our website. So if anyone wants more information on that, I'd be happy to share that. Um, so uh, are either of you aware of any other surgical approaches in development or, or not currently used for epilepsy uh, that would kind of fall under the categories of this, of this um, uh, learning chair um, that might eventually be an option for people with epilepsy? I, mean, I think we've touched on the radiation and the ultrasound, as you mentioned, as was mentioned before. So I think those are the, um, the, really it's developing nuances in those and ways in which we can better apply those. Uh, a lot of the research in uh, expanding the ways in which we uh, are developing new ways in which we do surgery has been in the uh, neuromodulation, which right. I know you're going to address at a later time. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So what are some of the most common fears that patients and families express to you when you mention surgery as an option, and how do you address these fears when you counsel them? Um, well, I think like any surgery, it tends to um, invoke some anxiety and, and fear in, in patients, but particularly when it's dealing with the brain, I think that tends to heighten uh, everything, and people are concerned about you know, what type of functional deficits they may be left with, um, will they be the same person? Will it affect their you know, personality or speech language? Um, and um, also, you know, how they want to know, is this going to cure their seizures? Um, and so you know, it's important that they have a, a realistic you know, understanding and expectation of uh, what, what the outcomes are based on their um, specific uh, type of epilepsy and, and the uh, diagnostic data that's been accumulated. Um, and maybe concerns about medications. You know, these, many of the patients with drug-resistant epilepsy are on several different anti-seizure medications, and so um, patients will often inquire about or, or hope that they can be on less medications after surgery, and, and that can sometimes happen, but it's, uh, it's important to uh, understand that epilepsy surgery is not done in, in order to get patients off of medication. So that's something I make very clear up front when uh, we're undergoing a pre-surgical workup um, is that, you know, anti-seizure medications are still going to be part of the treatment even, you know, if surgery is done. Right. Dr. Ayer, any other? Yeah, I would agree. I would, no, I would agree with that. I mean, I think it's really, it's Undergoing surgery is a is a big decision, and certainly is you know raises a lot of questions and concerns, and um, people want to know that they're, they're what the likelihood is they're going to make it through it, and also what are the chances that their seizures are going to go away or get better. Um, and yeah, for every individual, you know, it's it's uh, what they experience. So. We want to try and address that based on what we know relative to their specific epilepsy. Um, I I would say that one of the most common things that I have experienced is that patients and or individuals with epilepsy, and oftentimes neurologists who may not work with um, a big epilepsy center, uh, often overestimate the risks of surgery um, and tend to underestimate the, the benefits of surgery. Now, none of us want anybody coming into surgery um, believing that they're going to, you know, get some outcome that we can't offer, um, but, but surgery has become very safe, um, and I like to think we do a good job of really sharing what the expectations are. 
Right. And you, and you mentioned um, overestimating the risks of surgery. I think the other thing is underestimating the risks of not having surgery. Um, Absolutely. In, in terms Absolutely. of right. suit right. up and, 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 uh, seizure-related yep. uh, injury and, um, you know, cognitive decline, et cetera. So uh, that, that's obviously another important thing for, for patients and families to consider. Um, so can you briefly describe the relative roles of the epileptologist and the neurosurgeon in a typical epilepsy surgery? Go ahead, so it Chris. starts with, you know, with being an, an epilepsy uh, neurologist. So someone to, um, you know, get a full history, you know, from the patient, do a, an examination, you know, figure out, you know, what are the details of the types of seizures they have, how long have they been going on, um, what type of medications have they tried. Um, that, that's, you know, the, the first step. And then from there, you know, the neurologist or the epileptologist is the one that kind of guides everything from there in terms of, well, what tests do we need to do to better understand someone's epilepsy? Um, how do we interpret some of the test results um, in terms of this particular patient and trying to, you know, make hypotheses about, you know, where the seizures are coming from and if it's not clear based on imaging um, and EEG data, um, what do we need to do next um, uh, for further evaluation? And so then, you know, we refer patients to see neurosurgery once we've um, made, you know, that assessment that there are some surgical options, medications aren't working by themselves, um, and then, you know, we uh, refer to one of our epilepsy surgeons, and then we continue to collaborate to figure out what the best approach is for each patient. Okay. And Dr. Ayer, did you want to add anything? Yeah, no, I would agree. This is really a team effort. Um, throughout the process, and, you know, we recognize that uh, individuals not only may work with an epileptologist and a surgeon in a particular center, they may have someone that they have closer to home, a neurologist that they work with, and we really think it's important that we all are on the same page and work together as a team because um, that's how we get the best outcomes. Great. Um, so for someone trying to determine whether or not to have surgery, what are some of the decision aids that you can provide to assist them in choosing whether to have surgery and then, you know, if so, what type of surgery? Well, of course, the Epilepsy Foundation um, I, is a great resource, and I uh, always include the website information um, on my after-visit summary that I uh, give to patients when I see them in clinic. Um, because, you know, there's only so much you can uh, go over and discuss, you know, in a, in a confined office visit. And I think, you know, sometimes the kind of reading someone does on their own later, you know, really sinks in more and uh, sticks with them. So being able to read about um, the different types of epilepsy and um, surgeries, I think, gives, uh, you know, patients more of a comprehensive um, picture and gives them the tools to, uh, be able to make an informed you know, decision about um, what's best uh, for them, you know, in conjunction with discussing it with their uh, medical team. Yeah, I would agree. Oftentimes, this is a, a process um, of learning, reflecting, learning some more, having a conversation about it. I absolutely um, like for people to get the opportunity to speak to someone else who's been through it, if that's what they're interested in. It's you know, I can tell them what I've seen, but for someone who's actually experienced, I can I have found that to be very helpful um, for people in, in making their decisions. So we certainly try to connect others when possible. Great. And do you have? Um, I, I know it's it's impossible to give someone a percentage likelihood of seizure freedom, an exact percentage uh, that's customized for them. But do you are you able to kind of narrow that range? Because you know the 60 to 80 percent, are you able to narrow that a little bit based on individual um, patient factors or based on, sure. you know, your own center, uh, the, the data that you have from, from Henry Ford specifically or that you have as a specific surgeon or I guess what, what other things can help you to kind of give them a better sense of the likely outcome? 
I think we're often taking into consideration, I think the biggest thing, the biggest starting place in answering that question mm -hmm. for individuals is what kind of epilepsy and where, where in the brain is the epilepsy? What surgery are we talking about doing? Those are really the biggest um, factors in guiding what that percentage is, right? I mm -hmm. feel a lot more confident telling somebody we're on the 70 to 80 percent seizure freedom in someone who has right temporal lobe, mesial temporal sclerosis and temporal lobe epilepsy and every bit of information lines up to that being the location that the seizures are coming from and that we're gonna do a really good surgery for that. For someone whose epilepsy is not in the temporal lobe and does not have a, you know, a, something on a picture that we can pick out, we're gonna be lower on that scale. So we do, we kind of use that as a starting place yeah. Um, and then talk about, you know, the other factors from there. Right. Okay. Um, can you briefly discuss the extent to which um, scar tissue at the margin of the surgical resection or ablation and the neuronal networks beyond this margin can contribute to the lack of post-surgical seizure freedom? Sure. So, um, I would say that we look at seizure recurrence of seizures coming back in kind of two time frames. So there's the earlier time frame within the first year. That makes us concerned that we either didn't get all of what was causing the seizures or we were a little off in identifying where the seizures were coming from. So that's that usually makes us kind of retool and say, okay, we're where is it that things um, we didn't accomplish everything we wanted to accomplish? It, somebody who has seizures coming back later, we start thinking about things like you mentioned, like the scar tissue, like um, the neural networks. And certainly, and I, we know that the longer someone has seizures, the less likely they are to become seizure free, even if they do have surgery. And a lot of that is probably related to other parts of the brain becoming sensitized or having maybe little areas of damage that don't cause seizures on their own, but once the big seizure maker is removed, those areas have been irritated enough that they can start creating their own seizure network and another one pops up. So that's why we um, we think that patients who get to surgery earlier uh, tend to do better because the rest of their brain hasn't been subjected to the seizures for so long. That makes sense. Would you agree with that, Chris, or anything you would add? Yes, I, exactly. Yep. And um, I think, you know, reinforcing to patients that um, after two, you know, failure of two medication trials, you know, the likelihood of achieving seizure freedom just with more meds, you know, is, is very low. And so um, some patients will um, think for a variety of reasons, maybe some apprehension about surgery um, that, oh, they just need to get on the right, you know, combination of meds or the right cocktail. And certainly medication adjustment is always going to be an ongoing part of epilepsy management. But when, um, when the meds aren't working, then we have to start thinking about what else uh, we can offer. Right. Okay. So before we open it up for questions, do either of you have any closing thoughts for our listeners? I would just say thank you to everybody for giving us the opportunity to, to speak with you. I'm looking forward to hearing what questions you have. Same here. Okay, great. So I'm going to go ahead and um, unmute the lines. Okay, who'd like to get us started with a question? If I may, I can go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Thanks, go ahead. And now my son had, he, uh, the uh, surgeon and the epileptologist both have said the uh, seizures could be coming from either the frontal, the parietal, or the temporal lobe, and they have not been able to identify which one. So they are going to use the uh, subdural electrodes placing on his brain on all the three lobes to find out where <coughs> seizure activity they might be coming from. Now, I want to know, is there anything that I need to think before we go into the surgery, what are the precautions or what, what thoughts do you have for me uh, 
uh, if I were to go ahead with the surgery. How old is is your son? He's 14 years old. Okay. So it's certainly, um, that is one thing we didn't discuss, is that, you know, sometimes we need to head into a surgery um, in order to get the information that tells us what the right next treatment is because all of the non-invasive studies sometimes don't give us uh, the exact answer as to what's causing the seizures. So um, that can be a tough process because it's another uh, time in which someone's going to be in the hospital basically having had one brain surgery and then hanging out and waiting to have enough seizures for them to collect enough information um, before moving on to the next step. So I think that um, patience is, is required in that situation um, and sort of recognizing that, um, you know, the, the team is going to be making decisions and understanding things along the way as they gather the information. Um, so, patience. Okay, Dr. Paris, did you have anything to add? Or I think just stressing the importance of um, you know accurately identifying the seizure onset zone. Um, you know that that's really the key in in you know being able to undergo a successful um, intervention for epilepsy, whether it's resection or some of these other. Uh, modalities we've talked about, and so that you know, that may involve you know the in, uh, invasive EEG monitoring um, if the rest of the diagnostic data does not uh, make it clear. Yeah, can, can you briefly discuss um, SEEG as as a new a newer tool for that may have a similar function as the uh, placement of grids on the brain? Absolutely. So in placing the grids and strips, we're really placing sheets of electrodes over the surface of the brain tissue. And in order to do that, that means making often pretty sizable openings in the skin and the bone in order to place all of those electrodes. It can give us great information, and there are lots of times where we need to use those types of electrodes because we may need to cover certain areas. That's the only way that we can cover them. Um, but what we have been finding, experiencing, is that we can also map seizures with something called stereo EEG. So rather than opening up a large area of the head, we make a series of very tiny holes, kind of like the size of a, you know, a nail hole in a wall, basically, um, of tiny holes in the skull. And through that, we place an electrode that's kind of like the size of a piece of queenie that goes into the brain tissue. And we place those strategically, um, depending on what we know about the person's epilepsy before surgery. But it allows us sample a large area of the brain to record from a lot of areas of the brain. It is uh, very well tolerated. People tend to have less headaches. They feel better than um, if they have electro, you know, the grids and strips. Um, as they're sitting in the epilepsy unit waiting for the seizures to happen, they tend to feel okay um, without major headache or tiredness. Um, there's some, and they and and the the risk um, we have seen to be lower um, than doing the grids and strips. So again, there are times in which that the grids and strips are what is necessary for the individual's type of epilepsy. But um, we are moving more and more to using stereo EC uh, when we can because of those benefits. And and do is this something sorry, that you, most comprehensive epilepsy centers have, or or is it only a portion of comprehensive epilepsy centers that have that technology available? I would say it's a portion at this point. It's growing. Um, certainly, Henry Ford has a lot of experience with this, 
Um, and we have uh, excellent technology to help us very accurately place these electrodes, such as a, what's called a stereotactic robot. Um, but I, I see it being incorporated um, in more centers over time. Great. Okay, other question. Thank you. Yeah, Russ, um, my son had uh, encephalitis, and uh, he went through all the testing, and he, um, when he was 14, he's now 30, he now wears a neural pace and was told he was not a candidate for surgery uh, because his seizures are mirror seizures, and they were too close to, this was, of course, almost 15 years ago. Is it possible to become a candidate for surgery? After, you know, I mean. Okay, that's a good question. So can you talk, uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Paris or Dr. Eric, can you talk about what they what that might have meant, mirror seizures, what that might have meant, and then also someone who was told 15 years ago they're not a candidate for resection, can, is it worth that person being reevaluated? Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so a mirror seizure means that um, there's a seizure starting on one side of the brain in a particular area, and um, it it causes a similar seizure discharge to occur in the same part of the brain on the opposite hemisphere. Um, so, like a mirror uh, effect, I guess. And so, um, if there are seizures that are you know coming from different parts of the brain or two different sides of the brain. You know, in general, you know, the patients are not considered candidates for uh, resective epilepsy surgery because if you take out, um, you know, one area, then, you know, the other area will continue to produce seizures and the um, complications and um, potential neurologic deficits that would result from removing multiple areas of the brain makes that um, not feasible. Um, and so, um, you know, it's in many of those cases, something like RNS or NeuroPACE is uh, is utilized, and it can be very helpful. Okay. Ever, ever is there any case where it would be worth being reevaluated, um, even if that's what you were told? Um, potentially, if 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 it seems like they, you know the with NeuroPACE you. Um, have the benefit of getting diagnostic okay. information from that because it records uh, intracranial EEG data. And so if, if it seems like the seizures onsets are not being captured where the neuropace electrodes are placed, then, um, then yes, definitely I think a reassessment, um, you know, would be warranted and, you know, it might result in the neuropace electrode being moved so that they're, you know, in the proper seizure onset zone. Okay. Can I, if I can just add real yeah. quick to what uh, you and Dr. Harris were just talking about, that if somebody has undergone evaluation for workup for seizures and it's been quite a long time, you know, even 5, 10, 15 years, it is worth having that conversation again because we have learned uh, so many things in the last 5 to 10 years and have options now for individuals that weren't present before. Okay, great. Yes, and I would like to encourage older people not to be afraid because I was 44 when I had my brain surgery, and, it, and I have not had a seizure in nine years, ten years. Great. That's excellent. Oh, someone else had a question? Someone else had a question? Yes, sir, I do. Yes, sir, I do. What? Okay. Okay. My wife is going to be 51 Saturday, and she said uh, surgery at Henry Ford Hospital. I'm not sure what it was, but she has a vagal nerve stimulator. And her doctor's indicating to her now that she would probably be a good candidate for surgery. But my concern is the cognitive ability, because her cognitive ability is quite diminished right now. One of the things that I would uh, suggest thinking about is that, is that the epilepsy itself, continuing to have seizures, really hurts people's 
Memor ability to think and have good memory. And so oftentimes, if we can get the seizures under control, however that happens, the thinking and things get better or at least we stop the downhill slide of them getting worse. Yeah, that's a really good point. Can you ask a quick question, Liz? Sure. sure. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, for somebody that has had um, brain surgery, um, a younger patient on the left side, um, removal of the temporal lobe, part of the occipital and parietal lobe, I had heard one of you mention how it would be hard sometimes for them to recall things uh, looking at pictures. Um, I was wondering if that is a, a long-term side effect or after time that could get better. And I also wanted to just ask real quick, um, you had mentioned, somebody mentioned the jaw tightness from having the surgery. Can that also go down into like muscle pain in the neck? Um, for the muscle pain issue, it does not tend to unless we're, unless the surgery that they did also cut towards the back of the head. Sometimes that can happen. It's less likely. Um, but there's also lots of reasons why people can have muscle pain in the neck. Um, and, and as far as some of the changes that happen after surgery in terms of the thinking memory, um, if it got worse after surgery, I don't necessarily expect that to return. However, if you had conti been continuing to have seizures all this time, I would expect that worsening to have happened over time, if not to have gotten even worse than where things are now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, we, we need to wrap it up, so I, I, uh, if people do have remaining questions, you can certainly feel, feel free to email them to me or call me after uh, you know, tomorrow or something or later in the week. But um, I, we have to respect everyone's time. So I thank you very much, Dr. Aaron, Dr. Paris, for, for a great discussion, and, and uh, I think we all learned a lot. And um, look forward to uh, the next uh, Learn and Share, uh, which is on March 7th, um, public benefits and supports for adults with epilepsy. And um, if you have any, if you'd like any more information on this or other topics, uh, you can call 1-800-377-6226 or visit our website at epilepsymichigan.org. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Thank for you, having me. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks.